Hi, I'm Dr. Dean Adele. I'm a physician and host of the nationally syndicated Dr. Dean Adele Health Program. If you're watching this DVD, you are most likely in the position of having to make a very important decision on your child's behalf, whether or not to have your doctor perform a surgical procedure, a circumcision, on your son. As a parent, and I'm sure you will agree, it is incredibly important that we educate ourselves fully in such situations so that we can make the best and most informed decisions on behalf of our children. This is our intrinsic responsibility as parents and guardians of all children coming into the world. So the first question, obviously, is what is a circumcision? Truth is, most people don't even know what a circumcision is. Seriously. Ah, the heartwarming coo of a newborn baby. Actually, that crying is the result of the most common surgery performed in America, circumcision. It happens to over 60% of newborn male babies in the U.S. One million times a year, 3,000 times a day, once every 26 seconds, a newborn baby boy has the tip of his penis cut off. <laughs> no wonder that little newborn baby so pissed. the foreskin, but many people don't realize, is that the foreskin is actually a normal functioning part of a male's anatomy. The skin that covers the penis is unique. It is movable. It is not attached to underlying structures. So this skin goes out over the shaft of the penis in a tubular arrangement, up over the head of the penis, and at some point near the end of the penis doubles under itself. So this tubular mobile sheath of skin has the ability to unfold and enfold. So when the penis becomes erect, the inner foreskin unfolds and actually becomes the skin that covers the shaft of the penis. At the tip of the foreskin, as this foreskin takes a turn and becomes the inner foreskin, it transitions into mucous membrane. That doesn't mean it produces mucus. It's um, similar to the eyelids, for instance, where you would find an outer skin portion of the eyelid and an inner mucosal portion, or the lips as they transition from the skin on your face into the deep red mucosa of your mouth. The American Academy of Pediatrics also says that the foreskin is a protective part of the human anatomy. The foreskin, it turns out, is a highly nerve-laden, highly vascularized complex of sexual organs that are vital to natural sexual function. So now we know what the foreskin is and how it works. This then begs the question, why would we remove a normal functioning part of the body? There have been many varied reasons cited for the continuation of a practice deemed by medical associations worldwide as unnecessary. Here's what the American Academy of Pediatrics actually has to say. The benefits are not sufficient to recommend that all infant boys be circumcised. Adding, it's the most brutal thing I've ever seen in my life. Okay, they, they didn't say that last part. One interesting fact about circumcision is that there is no single argument or medical reason that points to the necessity of the procedure. And actually, the argument for circumcision has been quite varied, often based on religion, myths, and even fear. Circumcision is the only surgery on record that has been performed at times as a religious ritual, at other times as a puberty rite, and at times for a variety of other alleged medical reasons. During the 1800s, it was believed that masturbation caused disease, and so cutting off the most sensitive part of the genitals would prevent uh, boys and girls from touching themselves and masturbating, and that would prevent them from having disease. Well, it's probably this idea that the uh, boy must match his father. And uh, I've actually talked to people who have written child-rearing books who say that if the father is circumcised, the son must be circumcised or he'll suffer some psychological damage. Now, I've been doing this work for over 20 years, and I've never heard a stitch of evidence that this has ever happened, that a boy comes up to his dad and says, when do I get to have part of my penis cut off? The other myth is that the boy must match his peers. Those are actually two social myths that spring out of the medical myths. 
And the medical myths are these, that the foreskin is superfluous and redundant tissue, that babies are incapable of feeling pain. The pain involved in circumcision, to use the words of the American Medical Association, is severe and persistent. The other myth is that it is difficult to keep an intact penis clean. When in actuality, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that no cleaning is necessary, you do not need to retract the foreskin, you simply wash the external parts. Just wash it off with a little soap and water. We're in America, not some gutter on the poor side of Calcutta. We don't have to wash with sand, unless we want it. Today, soap is soft, it fights bacteria and smells like spring rain in Ireland or so we're told. So now as the circumcision rate is dropping, which is wonderful, we're faced with another problem, and that is that the physicians who are taking care of intact boys themselves don't have a foreskin, so they don't know how to care for it, and they've been given a lot of erroneous information by well-meaning medical sources who don't have the facts. It is important for parents to consider the actual surgical procedure. How does the doctor remove the foreskin? How much does it hurt the baby? Do they use pain medication? And what about the recovery process? Pain uh, is, is a critical issue. Pain is not insignificant, and that's a complication of every circumcision. Every physician that I've ever talked to, including pediatric urologists, don't know is that the underside of the penis and the lateral aspects of the penis are innervated by the perineal nerves. So if you're doing a dorsal nerve block, that may eliminate the pain on the upper side of the penis, but when you get cutting on the underside of the penis, the baby will start screaming. Circumcision is, is excruciatingly painful. Even if an anesthetic is used, um, the most effective anesthetic takes injections into the tip of the penis, so that hurts. And, and then once the an anesthesia wears off, the baby's going to experience the pain of a raw wound into which he urinates and defecates for um, a week to ten days while that wound heals. Infants are more sensitive to pain. We used to think that they didn't feel pain at all and they were doing open heart surgery on babies without anesthesia. But we now know that infants are more sensitive than adults to pain. And to do something like this as your first experience out of the womb is barbaric. The reason I started my work was because I heard the scream of a baby being circumcised. I, I had been told by the doctor that it didn't hurt and only took a moment and would protect my babies from um, all these terrible things that would befall them if they weren't circumcised. When I witnessed a circumcision, to see baby boy strapped to a plastic board, spread eagle, without an anesthetic, have a part of his penis cut off. And he screamed in a way that I'd never heard a baby scream before. I'd never heard that sound come out of any human being before. Um, and that really is what uh, instigated me and caused me to do the work that I've done. Next, we go ahead with the procedure. After the drapes are placed, we grasp the foreskin with a set of, with a couple of hemostats to stabilize them, like so. To break up the adhesion between the foreskin and the head of the penis. Then we place the clamp on the foreskin in the area we will cut to prevent bleeding. Next we make a slit in the foreskin and then peel the foreskin back from the head of the penis. The major 
risks to this procedure, as with any surgical procedure, are hemorrhage and infection. Occasionally injury to the poor skin and penis can result from this or any other surgical procedure. Caring for a circumcised penis is really hard because you've got a new wound and, uh, and a new little baby. So you have to protect it against infection and so on and so forth. An intact penis is very simple to take care of. In infancy, you wash the penis like you wash a finger. No one um, should retract the baby's foreskin. It doesn't need to be retracted. And in fact, you can't. It's attached to the head of the penis and somewhere between birth and, and puberty these two structures uh, will separate. And then a male can be taught to retract, rinse, and replace, very simple. Another argument to consider when trying to decide whether or not to circumcise your child is the issue of human rights. If in fact it is true, as previously documented, that the foreskin is a normal functioning part of the male anatomy, does a parent or guardian have the right to have it amputated, especially in the cases where aesthetics or the I want my son to look like me argument is the main reason? Do you as a parent or guardian own that right? Or is the choice one that your child should be able to make on his own behalf when he is old enough to make his own informed decision, thereby respecting the rights of the child to his own body? Every person has certain rights just by the fact that they're alive. They don't have to do anything, they don't have to have any special status. Just because they're a person, they have rights, human rights. We believe that male circumcision violates some of those rights. Um, for example, the right to bodily integrity and the right to protection. Um, people understand these rights with regard to girls a little better than they do with boys. And I think part of the reason for that is that the female circumcision doesn't usually happen in the U.S., and the male circumcision practice does, and it seems familiar to us. It seems it doesn't hurt. It happened to me, maybe, or it happened to my friend or my brother or my husband. It can't be anything bad, but in fact, it is bad. It, it has a number of things that it does that really, do, we believe, does cause harm. Taking something away from someone that they're going to be without forever, the only one who should decide that should be the person themselves. If it's going to happen when they're a child, it should be the child who makes that decision. And if the child is too young to make that decision, it shouldn't be done. You should wait until the child is old enough. Anything else is a violation of human rights and law. Remember, circumcision is non-therapeutic surgery done to a baby without need. There's no reason for doing it. Um, so to my way of thinking, we should leave the boy intact, not violate his being with pain and terror, and leave the decision up to him. It's his body. Let him make the choice for himself. I'm Paula Brinkley. I'm a pediatrician and I'm a mother. We chose not to circumcise my son um, after actually not very much discussion. It was a pretty easy decision for my husband and I. The only reasonable decision that I could make as a mother was to leave my son intact until he reaches the age where he can make that decision for himself. And he will do that, presumably, one way or the other when he reaches that age. But I couldn't live with myself making such an irrevocable decision on his behalf. So I believe very strongly that we all have a right to self-determination, that it should be our choice whether we want to have our body modified or not. And that right has been usurped by a c culture that thinks that this is a, a wise thing to do for all kinds of erroneous medical reasons, all of which have been disproven. And so the role of the father, who's generally the protector in the family, even if he doesn't believe in, in uh, keeping the boy intact, has the, still the duty to protect his boy's right to make the decision for himself, regardless of the father's decision. And it's that role to protect the boy that is fundamental for the father. Thank you. 
It's important to acknowledge that infant males are not the only children who are suffering from what is termed genital mutilation. In certain countries like Somalia, Sudan, or Ethiopia, it is, to this day, a common practice to circumcise young girls. I am uh, Soraya Murray. I'm from Somalia originally, uh, living in Los Angeles. I'm a human rights activist. The thing that really shocked me when I came to America was the reaction I got when people find out what was happening in Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia, those parts of the world, Egypt, about female genital mutilations, and people were horrified, they were shocked, they were angered. It, it, it was not even a feminist standpoint, but it was the rights of the child taking her, her humanity and integrity. But the close, behind closed doors, they were mutilating their own young you know, boys, sons. And, and it's everyday ritual here, but people don't see it as a ritual. But to me, I would see it as a ritual because it's the same, same thing to me, because mutilation is mutilation. I feel this is um, a really wrong uh, when it comes to child's rights. This is a human rights issue. And, and I think all of us need to protect young children's bodily integrity. And what amazed me is that when she showed me a tape a young boy who was just born having the surgery done exactly the same way they tied us like a goat on a table. You know, surgical table. This child just born right now. And his scream was exactly the scream that I heard when that young girl was brought before me. I felt the pain that he's in it because I've been there. I was exactly like him, so I saw myself in him. Young women lose a lot. The genital mutilations effect is a long, long-term, horrifying, mentally, physically, and emotionally. But we don't know what happened to young boys because they don't want to investigate. There is no doubt in my mind as a survivor that when I found myself tied to that table, that trust between my mother and I was broken. So you've been bonded with your mother for nine months in utero and you come out, if you're lucky you get held in arms, you start nursing, you're making a new kind of bond, and you suddenly have this traumatic sexual experience that's pain. You feel betrayed. We know that infants often won't look at their mother after they've been circumcised for some time. The trust bond is deeply broken and it takes a while to recover that, if ever. So circumcision interferes with breastfeeding, it interferes with sleep patterns, it's, it's like a total shock. The infant is plunged into shock. Often they think they've gone to sleep and it doesn't bother them. They've gone into shock, and they'll remain in shock for quite a while, maybe your whole life at some level. What would that give you as an impression of life? What does that do? You've got then scars physically on your penis, because all of these nerve endings have been removed, the most sensitive part of your body, and you've got psychological scars. You don't remember it, but you'll never forget it. And these are deep. This runs very deep both through the individual and a culture of people who are, by and large, circumcised, like the U.S. and several other cultures. If circumcision were done in the hallway instead of behind closed doors, it would stop tomorrow because people would know what was happening to their babies and they would never allow that to happen to them. So as you've seen, there are no specific agreed upon medical reasons for doing a circumcision. The idea of circumcising your baby boy so he'll look like that is kind of silly, isn't it? Especially when you look at the fact that in many, many states in America, most boys are today being left intact and many parents are saying no, and I agree with that. I'm Dr. Dean Adele, and thanks for watching.